Hello, uh, Marta. Hello. Oh. It's great to have you with us. Uh, so I'm Mateusz Józefowicz, and uh, uh, I have a uh, great pleasure to introduce Marta Ackman, the author of uh, Mercury 13, uh, the book that is uh, about to uh, show up in Poland uh, in autumn. Uh, I had the pleasure to be the translator uh, of this book, and uh, uh, it's wonderful, Marta, that you've agreed to, to tell us a bit more uh, uh, about uh, this work and about the topic and about the great women women that uh, uh, were building the uh, paving the way for for today's uh, space uh, endeavors but first of all mercury 13 there was no such a mission hello and and uh, thank thank you for your translation i'm very grateful for that and and to have the book be in, in poland um the Mercury 13 was a name that the group of women pilots gave themselves. Um, they were uh, hot shot uh, women pilots um, who had achieved all sorts of um, uh, accolades in the aviation world in, in the 1950s. But that, that was a name that they assigned themselves after they began secret testing uh, for the Mercury space program in the US. Uh, sounds, sounds wonderful. And uh, we, we know that all the missions uh, uh, in space uh, industry, in space endeavors are numbered. So the program of each mission is a subsequent number. So in this case, this is not a number of a mission, it's a number of the group. Uh, and there were 13 of them. Yes. Yes, okay. yes. It's it's um, it's the name of the group. And um, just as a side note, it, it's been interesting to me that um, uh, world um, soccer championship, soccer as we call it in the U.S., they're trying to get more and more women teams. And um, uh, the name of the new initiative to try to get uh, more international women's soccer is the Mercury 13. They, they, they chose the name because they thought it was a great symbol uh, for uh, women taking uh, major steps forward and as a way to honor um, the achievement of, of these women from the 1960s. In your opinion, was it a lucky 13 or unlucky 13? <laughs> we'll hope that it will, it will be the lucky thir 13. Uh, but space is not your regular topic, isn't it? Why, why a book about space? Well, um, uh, in some ways it is, because I, I write about uh, women who have changed America. I write biographies on women who have changed America. And um, I've written uh, on women baseball players, on the American poet uh, Emily Dickinson, and I'm currently writing a book on um, the country music star Dolly Parton. And, and what they all have in common, at least in my mind, is, is that they are women who know themselves. Uh, who often want to do um, uncommon things, and uh, they they know their own mind. And the reason I got into the Mercury Thirteen was um, uh, well, quite specifically, I I was reading about John Glenn going up for a second time. This was in the late 1990s, and way way down in the newspaper article was a paragraph that said, "And Jerry Cobb, spelled J E R R I E." is saying, when do I get my first chance? And I had never heard that name before. And it started me doing some digging. And it particularly struck me because I grew up in St. Louis, which was home to the McDonald um, Aircraft uh, Corporation, which won the contract to design the first Mercury space capsule. And in the 1960s, literally every father on my block and I say father, because there weren't women engineers being allowed to do the work. Every father on my block was working on that project. My own father um, was a cartographer and he later worked designing um, maps for the, for the lunar program. Um, so it just struck me, why, why don't I know anything about this when I have a personal knowledge of the space program that got me researching um, and I was off and running and decided to do a book and uh, interview all the women I could. So would you say that Jerry Cobb is the main protagonist of your story? 
Well, that that's a very interesting question. When you have 13 main characters, um, it, you can't write a book like that. You do have to focus on particular ones. So Jerry was certainly the first, and I would say um, the leader of the group. But then I also focused on um, Wally Fung, who was the youngest uh, and, and really did push to go as far as she could. That name is probably familiar to many of your listeners because um, she went up with Jeff Bezos um, uh, in Blue Origin uh, just in the past, I've forgotten, year, year or two. Um, a couple of the other women also uh, took more major roles in part because they had they were the most vocal. They had interesting stories to tell. But uh, cer certainly Jerry Cobb, as the leader of the program, um, needed the spotlight on, on her. She was very important. So the readers uh, of the books about space programs are really used to reading uh, all those great adventures of the astronauts who went to space or uh, went around the moon, etc., or, or preparing for some other missions. And this is a book about uh, women uh, who did not go to space. So what, what is actually so... Uh, uh, why did you find this topic so important? Uh, it, it apparently seems that uh, there are more important things, like, like people actually walking on the moon. <laughs> well, I, I think what they did was pretty important, and I think it was important for this reason. Before they began to push, um, and uh, I'll do a little bit, bit of a, a backstory. Um, Randy Lovelace was the um, head of life sciences for NASA, and he picked the, the Mercury 7 astronauts. And it was his idea to say, I wonder what would happen if we would test top flight women pilots. So he called through lists of, of uh, women pilots who had really high accomplishments. And eventually these 13 were chosen. Um, they went through uh, two, two and three phases of the, um, of the testing program before the Navy shut the whole program down. They, they said, uh, we, don't, we don't want women taking this next step and, and the NASA had agreed. And it was at that point that this scientific story, a story of, of women hoping to be, to, to be astronauts, to, to achieve that goal. It was at that point where the scientific story turned into a political one. And that's when they began to push, push the United States Congress um, to uh, to allow women into space. And that is so much the trajectory of women's accomplishment in the United States. You need somebody knocking on that door first before somebody the door opens and someone is able to walk through. So without the Mercury 13 making the very, very important case that not only were women capable of going into space, but they had the right to do it. Without them, we wouldn't have women in the space program today, or at least we wouldn't have them beginning to be involved as, as quickly as they were, even though that took time as well. So for a, uh, for a modern uh, reader, especially for a young generation, I think uh, a, a, a notion that uh, women can't do uh, things like going to space or being engineers is quite... Uh, uh, unbelievable, I would say. Uh, although, although uh, probably some traces of those old attitudes, uh, in, especially in some uh, societies, could be could be seen. Could you uh, tell a bit more about uh, why this topic was important in the sixties, and and uh, why there was so much uh, noise around it? That uh, why it became a political issue. Oh, it was it was just sexism, you know. It it was um, it. it the kind of backlash, the kind of pushback that, that these women received um, was, as you said, just incredible to a, a lot of modern thinking. One of the women um, was a woman by the name of Jerry um, Truehill. And when she came back from the secret testing, she was met by her husband on the tarmac of, of, the, um, of the airport with divorce papers. And he handed them to her and said, and said, no wife of mine is going to go into space. He thought he, he looked upon his wife as property and, and he was threatened. He was also a pilot. He was threatened by, by the idea that she could do something that, that he wouldn't. Um, uh, 
Janie Hart was a num another member of the Mercury 13. She was the wife of Senator Phil Hart, um, a, a United States Senator from Michigan. And uh, she was a mother of, I've lost, can't remember exactly now, but eight or nine children. And uh, reporters came up to her all the time, you know, and said like, how can a mother go into space? Why would you abandon your children? Of course, um, John Glenn wasn't asked that question. Scott Carpenter wasn't asked that question. So it was just the double standard. And within the scientific community, um, many, many people said, well, we really don't know how a female body might perform in space. We, have, we don't know much about, about, about the, the female body. So it was just um, uh, a, a, a lack of comprehension that, um, that women could do this and that women wanted to do this. Um, you know, I, I talked to many of, of the Mercury 13 that said that the motto for um, pilots was that you always wanted to go higher, faster, and farther. And of course, going higher, faster, and farther for them at that moment in, in history meant going into space. It's what they wanted to do. Jerry Cobb told me that she was willing to give her life to be able to go into space. Uh, do you think that those uh, attitudes have uh, have changed uh, now, uh, or are oh. they really the traces of of those uh, like sexism and uh, uh, some kind of hermetical societies that do not let uh, anybody from outside in, especially in let's say engineering or science? Uh, do you think that it changes in the U.S., Europe, but also in in other societies like more conservative ones? Oh, I, I think I think most definitely there are those lingering attitudes. Um, uh, in the U.S., we are we have are far from uh, viewing women as as equal to men. And I think in in what we call STEM, uh, you know, science, technology, and engineering, mathematics, I think there are special biases there. If, if you just look at the numbers, you know, you see that there are. Um, that there are fewer women, although that's increasing, definitely increasing, um, going into those fields than, than there are men. And I think that's what the story of the Mercury 13 um, can teach uh, men and women in the United States and around the globe, certainly, um, that, that these women were held back only because of sexism. And when we see vestiges of that around the world, we, we need to remind ourselves that there have been barriers like that all the time that have indeed been broken. Um, so I think uh, uh, one of the messages of, of, of this book is that um, wherever there is an obstacle um, that is based on uh, sex or race, um, uh, on sexuality, we, we need to say to ourselves, the world always needs to open up. We, we, do, not, we do not go backwards. We need to continue to open. Uh, we, we have witnessed uh, a development of new players uh, in space uh, races. Uh, like Japan is very strong, uh, China, of course, uh, but the recent landing uh, in India, uh, India. Of, of the Indian uh, spacecraft on the moon, uh, or uh, United Arab Emirates uh, sending their, uh, their probes to, to Mars. Those organizations uh, come from countries that are quite patriarchal and very conservative in, in mm -hmm. their hierarchy. Uh, mm. But they still do uh, employ, and they uh, they they show on media that uh, there is uh, a parity in, in the teams. Uh, there are women um, uh, in in charge of uh, important tasks. There are no women in charge of the whole organizations there, but mm -hmm. there are women indeed uh, uh, sitting at the at the important meetings at the tables and and shown on TV. Do you think that it is only PR? Uh, or is it an actual uh, actual um, change in those societies that could be maybe able to to implement such new solutions even faster than than let's say the old space powers like US yeah. And, yeah. and Russia? Well, I think I I, I think that it is faster, but um, even if it is PR, and and I would agree with you, there is an element of that. Um, even if it is PR, it 
uh, it reflects that the organization knows that this is the way they should be moving, you know, that they want the outside to, to um, think that they uh, are incorporating women. Um, so we, we continue to push. Um, uh, it, it, it does not happen overnight and, and you, you need people um, always to call attention to it. I know when I interviewed Jerry Cobb or uh, Jerry Truehill that I mentioned earlier, whose husband met her on the tarmac with divorce papers. She, at the time I interviewed her, I think she was in her sixties. And I said, um, I asked her, I said, what do you do now? Uh, and she said, I'm a guard dog. And what she meant by that, she said that she always kept her eye on NASA and made sure that they were taking women into account in, in their decisions. And if they didn't, she called them out on that. She mm. was critical of them. So I think we need guard dogs too, like um, Jerry Truehill to uh, examine um, all the efforts around the world um, uh, to get more and more women, not only into space, but in, into uh, STEM programs as well. We need, we, we need their intelligence. You know, I think that, that the, one of the greatest um, uh, losses uh, uh, to sexism and racism is, is the loss of talent. You know, we need all minds working on this. Um, who knows who can solve something that another person cannot? So why shut the door? Um, we need to be a, a, as open and <clears throat> as um, as involved uh, uh, with um, uh, as many people who have the will and the aptitude um, uh, to keep, keep them there and to keep them pushing for answers. Mm -hmm. do, do you think that there are some differences uh, between you, uh, particularly U.S. and or North America, like U.S. and Canada and Europe? Uh, they, those are the areas that are culturally, I'd say, very close uh, in, in, in certain aspects, uh, ser obviously. Uh, and their space programs are, uh, European space programs kind of follows uh, the, the footsteps of the American uh, one. Of course, it has its own, uh, its own profiles, uh, but generally the attitude is, is similar, that this is kind of... Uh, uh, the same attitude towards exploration, towards science. Uh, have you been noticing any, uh, any, uh, and towards culture and democracy as well? Uh, have you been noticing any particular differences or, or similarities between European and, and US attitudes uh, towards, uh, let's say, sen sending anybody particular to space, a man or a woman? Um, I, I don't know that I can speak to that, 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 that specifically. Um... Uh, but if, if you're saying that, that the U.S. Uh, and North, North American programs are a kind of model that, that others want to follow, I, I, I would hope that would mean um, in terms of always pu pushing for, for equity. What do, what do you think of uh, the recent uh, Russian attempts? Uh, do you think this is not a, a meant attempt, but it is a kind of uh, attempt to, uh, to go back to the race that they have neglected uh, uh, for a long time, and now they tried to uh, they tried to quickly catch up and do something uh, spectacular. But what do you think about their beginnings? Uh, do you think that the fact that they've sent the first uh, woman, uh, first uh, first woman to space, was uh, uh, was that also a PR, or was it uh, really a practical uh, practical solution? that would prepare them better for building uh, like an equal uh, society as they wanted? Well, that, that's a very interesting question. Um, uh, I guess the, the cynic in me would say that uh, launching Valentina Tereshkova um, in those in the early 60s was a bit of a PR stunt because in that in that time there was a space race. It wasn't cooperation. It was the idea of who got into space first. Um, so if so, if Americans were able to get uh, the first man into space, the first dog into space, you know, there there was this kind of fierce Cold War competition. So getting the first woman in space was a mark, you know, for um, uh, for for the, the the Russians at that at that time. And I, I can tell you that um, talking about that topic with the Mercury 13 women, they they would just shake their heads. You know, they would say, 
that that she was being used and they they hmm. would say that she wasn't um a pilot of the same level that 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 they were but she did serve the purpose you know hmm. of pushing a little bit further Indeed. so um uh I, I i do think that that her her presence and her accomplishment um did nudge uh the the us program a little bit although it would take several more decades before um, uh, Sally Ride went into space. And and as the Mercury 13 would always point out, Sally Ride went into space as a, as a scientist and not as a pilot, not as a commander. So it would be many more years before um, Eileen Collins became uh, the first commander of the space shuttle. I, I was there for her launch when she, um, when she became the first woman to command uh, uh, the shuttle. And um, I remember talking to her afterwards about the role that the Mercury 13 played in her own life. And she said she hadn't even heard of them, which is not surprising when she was growing up. But she said, imagine what would have happened if they would have failed those tests instead of passed them. She said it would have set back women in space in the United States at least a generation. And I think she's probably right. What would have happened if the Mercury 13 actually did go to space, in your opinion? <laughs> well, um, I, I, I think several of them would have had a very, very good chance, uh, given their, their individual skills. Certainly Jerry Cobb, um, some of the others as well, who were uh, specialists in communications. Um, I, I think it would have had an enormous impact, uh, not only for women contributing to the space program, but also for inspiration uh, to to begin to, you know, chisel away at, at this notion that 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 women have, have as many dreams and abilities as, as men do. Um, another book that I wrote was a was a book called Curveball, which was about the first woman to play professional baseball uh, in the Negro Leagues of the of the 1950s. And some of the people I interviewed for that book said something similar. You know, they said the sight of this woman, her name was Tony Stone, running out to second base at Yankee Stadium, playing professional baseball was an inspiration. And not necessarily to say, oh, I can play baseball, but I can pursue whatever dream I want to pursue. And I think that's one of the most important points about um, the Mercury 13 story. So coming back to the group themselves, uh, you have talked to many of them. Uh, did they perceive their effort as a kind of uh, competitive program or did they feel like a part of this national uh, program and they just participated in, in a joint effort? Uh, what was their attitude towards that? You mean competitive among themselves or competitive? Uh, competitive uh, among uh, actually the 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 main uh, the mainstream of male uh, program. Was it like a building an alternative or uh, to oh. to the program run by run by men for men, or uh, did did they really wanted to contribute to to joint effort? Well, they they needed the effort of NASA certainly to be behind them because they 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 couldn't go alone. But um, no, I I think they they saw it very much as a cooperative program. And um, one of the things that fascinated me in in interviewing them, and I uh, when I started the book in the late nineteen nineties, um, I think I I think only three of them had had died. So I talked with with most of them certainly and and one thing that struck me is that they weren't bitter <laughs> mm. you know i think i think if um if it had been me <laughs> i don't know i think i'd be pretty angry I, i'd be pretty bitter at, at a at a door slammed in my face but they never were and and they were always championing um the the space effort and and at that launch that I mentioned where Eileen Collins became uh, the first uh, female commander, um, all of the ones who were able were there cheering her on. Um, and it wasn't like, oh, that's what I wanted to do. But it's there goes somebody who's who's living my dream and opening the doors for others. So that kind of um, magnanimous attitude uh, uh, really speaks well of them, I think.
Today is uh, an era of uh, private space flight, and we have great private entrepreneurs. Most of them are men. Why do you yeah. think it's it's that? Like uh, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, uh, um, uh, Richard Branson. Uh, they they yeah. are the, they are the dreamers. Uh, they are the businessmen, the CEOs. Uh, what do you think is the way for women to to join the? We we had a, a trip of Anoushek and Sari uh, several years ago to the. Uh, to the International Space Station, and there was a, uh, a, a brief moment that uh, people thought that this is the first, uh, this is the first uh, space uh, space woman entrepreneur. Entrepreneur. Why do you think uh, it's not uh, the way today, or maybe there there is a chance that this will change soon? Um, I think it's money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think it's uh, uh, the men who have an exorbitant amount of money and have a, a, a vision of, uh, of space flight, have that kind of um, commitment. So in, in my judgment, it's that uh, we don't have women with that kind of money and that kind of um, uh, excitement about space yet. Perhaps, perhaps we will. I, I, I hope so. Um, um, I, I hope to see a world where Well, I don't. I don't know. I sort of say I hope to see a world where women billionaires can participate that can participate in that and uh, as well. But now I'm thinking. I don't know if I want to see a world where there are more more billionaires and and a, a greater um, a greater in, income gap. Um, uh, I would rather see uh, uh, more equity across the board. I think. Would you agree that in order to to build a space? society we need uh, equality oh by all means a absolutely yes we uh, we are uh, also visiting the space robotics event the european rover challenge and uh, um, this event hosts many uh, young uh, engineers enthusiasts uh, um, scientists but but also uh, professionals from space agencies from mm -hmm. from the local uh, administration Uh, from business, uh, they're watching robots, they're building robots, there are teams of uh, girls and boys who actually have a great time on building uh, joint projects and uh, to competing on our uh, artificial planetary grounds. Uh, would there be anything particular that you would like to uh, say to them, to encourage them uh, to, to pursue their passion? Despite of the uh, of the all the uh, the, the uh, uh, all the obstacles that arise. Oh, I would applaud them. I I would just say I'm so excited to see that that, that kind of energy, that that kind of enthusiasm, that that kind of um, intelligence uh, uh, being being exhibited. So I I would encourage them and in, in, in every way to. Uh, to cooperate with each other, to learn from each other, to never let themselves be stopped by thinking um, that they that they can't move forward, that they don't want to take a leap. I think you always have to take a leap. You always have to believe in in yourself. And um, I I couldn't applaud the kind of effort that you all are involved in. I couldn't applaud it anymore. And and. Uh, Hope, hope that the young people involved feel thoroughly encouraged and that, that they have generations behind them uh, saying, keep, keep moving forward, keep taking that leap. Thank you very much, Marta. I think that this summarizes the way I perceive your book. It is not a book about uh, women uh, fighting against the odds. It's about humans fighting against the odds. And uh, this is, I think... Uh, Uh, what you uh, wanted to to say to those students that do not give up, uh, wh whoever you are, follow your passion and do not give up. That's important. That's very important. Thank thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much, and uh, hope to host you in Poland someday. <laughs>